Welcome to Masterclass, a collaboration between the virtual world diplomacy community and Brother Board's Diplomacy Dojo. Today's Masterclass is led by Marcus Zilstra. Marcus has a YouTube channel where he goes by the name Diplostrats. He discusses all things diplomacy. Uh, thank you all for coming to today's masterclass. Marcus came to me and wanted to discuss the mathematics of stalemate lines. I didn't even know that was a thing, so I'm really interested to see what Marcus has to say. Thank you all for coming, and Marcus, thank you for leading this discussion. All right, yeah. Um, shall I hop into it properly now, or are we going to wait a little bit longer for people? Go ahead and hop right into it. Okay, perfect. Right, so this is uh, my Virtual World Diplomacy Community Masterclass on the Mathematics of Stalemate Lines. Now, I know know these uh, masterclasses are usually about getting better at diplomacy. Uh, this one is more of a talk about something related to the game, which I find interesting. Uh, if you're looking to improve your tactics or strategy, then I'd highly recommend checking out the other ones over on Brotherboard's uh, site, his library of archived masterclasses. Now, um, if you are live in the chat right now, please make sure that you click the, uh, the, the live button next to my voice, well, next to my um, name, even in the chat, because that should give you access to the slideshow, which is kind of important for this. All right. So this part is probably superfluous for, uh, for the people who are here, but we'll dive straight into this question anyway. Um, it was mostly for a different presentation that I did this with. Uh, what exactly is diplomacy? Well, diplomacy is a board game set in the First World War where seven players each control one of Europe's great powers and vie for control of the continent by ordering around their armies and fleets to take control of various supply centers. Taking 18 of those wins you the game. It was initially created in 1959, but it still has something of a cult following and a strong tournament scene, as you'll know in this Discord server. So what makes Diplomacy different from other board games? Why does it have that cult following still? Well, one word, negotiation. Uh, other games feature negotiation as a bit of a supporting mechanic. For example, you might negotiate to trade in Settlers of Catan. You might try to convince someone else not to attack you in risk. Some games market themselves very heavily around negotiation, like Game of Thrones, the board game, which is you all sit at a table and discuss. Diplomacy goes up above and beyond on that. Its primary mechanic is negotiation. Uh, you're encouraged to use the majority of your turn, usually 15 minutes in face-to-face, -to, -face, to go and talk to other players and convince them to do what you want them to do. Let's have a quick look at how diplomacy's orders work. Again, I'll speed through this because most people here will know. Um, turns are simultaneous. All players take their turns at the same time in diplomacy. They spend 15 minutes talking to one another, then they write down their orders, one for each of their units. Orders are then revealed and carried out simultaneously as well. Now, there are a number of possible orders. Hold, which stays in place. Move, which moves to an adjacent province. Uh, support, which assists another unit's move. And importantly, that can be used for other people's units. And convoy, which allows an army unit to leapfrog over a fleet unit over the sea. And the results of a turn will look something like that on the right-hand side. So something important in diplomacy is the combat. It's surprisingly simple considering how large the rulebook is. You take the base strength of a unit, which is always one. You add the valid supports for that unit, which is plus one strength each, and the side with the highest strength wins. If tied, nobody moves. Now, two important things here. First, supports can be cut. If it's attacked, uh, it will not be valid. Now, that's not always true. That's where the rulebook becomes a bit big, for our, but for our purposes, we'll treat it as though it is. Second thing, uh, you must be adjacent to the target of an attack to support the attack into it. So, for example, in the top example there, Greece is supporting Eastern Mediterranean to Ionian. Greece is not adjacent to Eastern Med. It is adjacent to Ionian. Um, that is the important part. 
So now, hopefully, the bit where it gets interesting for people who already know diplomacy. <laughs> combat in diplomacy is built to encourage negotiation. Diplomacy's combat is deterministic, it's significantly lopsided, and it's pretty minimalist. Now, deterministic means no randomness. No event cards you draw, no dice you roll, all the outcomes are predictable. If you know everyone's orders on the board, you will know the results of the phase. That makes it incredibly advantageous to know the orders of other players. The more you know about what the rest of the board is doing, the more effective you can make your own orders. Combat is also significantly lopsided in favor of the defenders. This is because the defenders win on ties. If you want to make progress against another player, you will usually need to outnumber them significantly, or else your progress will be incredibly slow. And since you build more units as you control more territory, the only way to outnumber them significantly by yourself is to have already made progress. <laughs> Which is a bit of a difficult thing to have done, it's an endless circle, right? So really you need the support of other players to do that. By default, the defenders should hold out and nobody should make any progress. And finally, it's minimalist. Remember how in order to support an attack on a province you need to be adjacent to it? Well, Diplomacy's map is generally very low connectivity. Most provinces have about five to six connecting provinces, uh, some of them quite a bit more, for example, the North Sea, but even then it only goes up to, I think, 11, something like that. Consider that some of those will usually be behind the province relative to your forces and somewhere you can't get to, and you can see that it's actually really difficult to attack any province with a large amount of force. Generally, the most supports you'll see for any attack in the entire game is three. And even that is kind of rare. It's usually to take something very high connectivity, like North Sea, Ionian, or the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. Um, diplomacy works as well as it does because all of its mechanics give the defender a significant advantage. So if you want to win the game, you need to significantly outnumber and outmaneuver them, something which is usually only possible by getting other players on your side. So now let's move to one of the subjects of the presentation. Oh, hang on, I've forgotten to move the actual thing. <laughs> okay, well, you can look at the slides afterwards, I'll provide them to you. Um, they're not particularly uh, in depth, as you can see here. Right, so stalemate lines, one of the actual uh, subjects of this presentation. So a stalemate, very simply, is a position that cannot be broken. Stalemate lines are defensive positions which can be held indefinitely by entering the same orders over and over and over and over. There's no randomness in diplomacy, so if a defensive position holds against all possible attacks, it just can't break. The attacking player could attack it forever and it won't break as long as the defending players keep entering their orders. Usually in the end game, all players who are out of contention will try to form a stalemate line which controls enough supply centers to prevent the leading player from winning. The position shown here is called the major stalemate line, and it's the most common one of these. In diplomacy, you need to deal with your own side of the board, either the north or the south usually, before crossing that arid desert that you see along the middle, the Livonia, Prussia, Cilicia, etc., all the way down to North, Atlantic, uh, north Africa even. Uh, since there are 17 supply centers on both sides of the board, this means that the most likely place an otherwise winning player would be stopped is when they try to cross that line. It takes time during which the defenders can set up their line. There's an equivalent position defending the south on the other side of the non-SC desert, but in this uh, presentation we'll mostly focus on this northern position because it's just the easiest one to talk about. So we will talk about the specifics of the stalemate in a while, but first there's been a conspicuously missing segment of this presentation, and it's the part, of course, everyone loves, mathematics. I've promised the mathematics of stalemate lines, and we've seen stalemate lines, but no mathematics. I know you're all waiting with bated breath, so let's talk about my dissertation. Mm. All right, I appear to have reordered those two things by accident, but whatever. The solo is the goal, a draw is worth more than a loss. That's the, the concept of a stalemate. Um, the lie that became truth, dramatic title for this segment. 
There was a game that was played a while ago called Media Wars, featuring seven content creators, all of whom made their own content on the game afterwards. My DiploStrats video on it is currently the longest diplomacy video on YouTube, coming in about an hour longer than the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy put together, or about an hour shorter than all of the extended editions put together. It probably won't surprise you to hear that most people don't watch all of it. Uh, two of the players who I know have not watched all of it are Flash of Legendary Tactics and Village Idiot of the Diplomacy Briefing, two of the other players players in this game. How do I know that? Well, let's talk about stuff that happened in Media Wars. This is a big spoiler for the end of Media Wars. I'm afraid if you were looking to not get spoiled on that, you should have probably watched the Media Wars stuff earlier. Right, so, spoiler alert, this game ended in a near stalemate position against Brother Wars Germany. Getting in this position was incredibly frustrating on my part, because Flash in Austria was not used to playing diplomacy under conditions where a stalemate would occur. He was used to playing it where everyone would say, okay, we just play until someone hits 18, and so people would eventually just give up. Um, and he was continuing to attack myself in Russia and Village Idiot in Italy while Brother Board was getting increasingly close to a solo. He did eventually cause the line for the... Uh, Form the line, even, but the delay on it caused me to write some absolutely massive essays on why the stalemate line was needed. Like this one. Oh, hang on, that's not all of it. Like this one. Oh, wait, no, that's still not all of it. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so this was one of the messages I said, oh, wait, no, that's not all of it. There was still one finishing uh, paragraph. And actually, that finishing paragraph is the relevant bit for this presentation. Uh, as you can see, I got a bit carried away. <laughs> About, uh, so with that final um, paragraph, the first line of it says, uh, well, the second line of it, but endgame and stalemates are my speciality. My university dissertation is on stalemate lines. I know what I'm talking about here, and I know you don't have one, and Germany very much does, and is going to win if you continue. Now, about seven and a half hours into my Media Wars video, I state that this is a lie. <laughs> I cover it very briefly, and I say I was so frustrated, I was just basically throwing anything at him to try and get him to actually go to the line. Uh, as with most lies, there was a little bit of truth to it. I had considered doing my dissertation on this, but I had not actually reached the point where I'd done any kind of dissertation yet. So, if we move ahead here... Um, how do I know they didn't watch my video? <laughs> well, after the game concluded, this lie started popping up in a few places. It actually made a few people contact me to ask me if they could read this thing that didn't exist. Uh, Flash made reference to it in his legendary tactics video covering the game, but the one that got meme to wait in an inch of its life by my friends was Village Idiot's later diplomacy briefing article about the characteristics of a strong diplomacy player. It's a great article, but there's one section that reads, they are students of the board, and it makes reference to the fact that I did my university dissertation on stalemate lines. Uh, here is an example meme from some of my uh, diplomacy friends <laughs> that they sent me as soon as this came out. So, after a while, I think after maybe two years, this actually happened. Um, I went ahead and did my dissertation on university stalemate lines thanks to a, sorry, my university dissertation on stalemate lines thanks to a fantastic professor at the University of Glasgow called Gethin Norman. He agreed to supervise my slightly ridiculous project. Uh, it should be noted this isn't a postdoctorate dissertation or anything like that. It's just an undergraduate final year project but it still had a dissertation attached, so I'm going to claim that it is the prophecy fulfilled. Now, the actual dissertation is quite padded out and not very fun to read, uh, so I'll just cover the most interesting yeah, parts yeah. of this masterclass. Uh, so, we are going to move ahead to the actual math part now and go to graph theory. Now, what is a graph is the first part of this. Uh, you may initially think of stuff like this. The first two are things I found on Google when I Googled graphs. Uh, the second, the third one is the viewer attention for Media Wars, <laughs> which, as you can see, goes fairly low throughout. 
Um, but no, this is not what we mean by graphs in graph theory. What we actually mean is this. So a graph has two important characteristics. It's got nodes. They're these circles that you see here, and they're all labeled with a name. In this case, it's letters. And they have edges which connect those nodes together. And really, that's just the basics of a graph. You can do all kinds of things with this in mathematics, a surprising amount, in fact. Uh, these graphs usually represent something. For example, the nodes might be towns and the edges might be roads between them. It would tell you where you could get to from any particular town in this case. Now, the one here is the most basic kind of graph. It shows connections, but it doesn't contain any other information. So a more useful graph might give you a little more information. For example, maybe uh, numbers on the edges telling you how uh, far it is between those two towns. So here, for example, would be a slightly more useful graph. It tells you how far between. I've just said this is in kilometers, but honestly, in mathematics, everyone always just discards the unit at the end and just says the number. Um, note that a graph is abstract. So D to E looks very short, but it's actually just as long as A to B. Uh, A to D looks quite long, but it's actually only two kilometers. Uh, this is because mathematicians don't like the real world and like to abstract everything else. Now, I'm going to introduce a series of graph theory problems, which will be pretty crucial to know about later on. Don't worry, you do not need to solve any of these. Thankfully, other people have already done that for us. And like, I was very glad I didn't have to solve any of these either. Uh, although the first one is not too difficult. Graph traversal. If I start at A, which nodes can I reach just by continually traveling through edges? Now, the graph on the right is two dis disconnected segments, right? It's got a big lump of nodes on the left and a small lump of nodes on the right. It's fairly easy for us as a human to look at that and say, well, I can get to everything on the left. I can't get to the stuff on the right because there's no edges that take me there. Um, but it's less easy for a computer to just see it like that. And ultimately, we want computers to do things like this because when these graphs get very, very big, it's not really practical for a human to go through and go uh, what's connected to what. It's much faster for a computer to do it. So we want an algorithm, a set of instructions we can give to a computer that will solve this by get it to solve it by itself. One of these is called breadth first search, and it's fairly straightforward. So you mark your starting node as visited and you explore all edges connected to it. Then you repeat with any non-visited nodes you find and you do that until you have nowhere left to go. So first we'll mark A as visited and we'll go along all the edges connected to A and see what we find. We find B and F. And then we mark B and F as visited and we check out all the edges connected to them and look at the next set of nodes. Um, and we find C, D, and G. And then we just do that again. And note that there is a node, uh, an edge that's highlighted there between C and D. But because we'd already visited those two, that didn't do anything. Uh, it didn't show us anything new. But we did find E on that last iteration. So we have found E, and we mark E as visited, and then we've got nowhere left to go. There's no more edges we can find. And that is just the breadth first search algorithm. Just visit a node, visit all the nodes connected to it, and carry on. <laughs> uh, and that solves the graph traversal problem. It's one of the more simple problems in graph theory. So now we're going to move on to a bit of a more complicated one. By the way, if anyone wants to ask a question at any point, feel free to call out and stop me. Uh, we're going to move on to maximum flow which is quite a bit more complicated. So in this uh, scenario, we've got our edges are pipes. They're pipes which water can be sent along, and you'll note that they are directed. Uh, <laughs> admittedly, a little bit crudely, because I was scribbling on this to get the presentation done, um, but there are arrows pointed down the pipe showing which way the water goes. So for example, it goes from A to B, it goes from B to C. You cannot send water from C to B. That is against the law. Um, nodes are pumping stations which direct the water. So the nodes 
for example, when you send water from B to C, C then decides, do I send it to D or do I send it to E or do I send some amount of it to both of them, right? And there are two special nodes. There is a source node at the start, it is called A, and there is a sync node at the end called E. The source node generates as much water as you want it to, and the sync node consumes as much water as you want it to. Every other node cannot consume or create water. So if you send four units of water into B, you have to take four units of water back out again. It's not allowed to just absorb it. It's also not allowed to send out five units of water if it's only received four. So that is the maximum flow graph. The maximum flow problem is how do I get the maximum amount of water from the source to the sink in this graph? Um, Oh, I, yeah, I did not speak about capacity angle. So the little numbers on the side are the capacity of each pipe. That's the amount of water you can send down it. Um, for example, you can send a maximum of six units of water from A to B. You can send a maximum of one unit of water from A to D. That must be a very small pipe. You cannot send more than the maximum capacity along that route. So something you can do is just send one water from A to B. And if you send one water from A to B, because we know that only the source can create water and only the sink can consume it, we have to send that one water along further. So there's only one option from B, we go from B to C with one water. And now C gets a choice, do I send it to D or do I send it to E? Well, E is the sink, we might as well send it straight there. And yay, we've got one unit of water to the end, but we can surely do better than that, right? For one, we could just increase all the water that we're sending along this pipe to four, because all of these pipes have capacity at least four. The bottleneck is C to E down here at the bottom, which has exactly four. We can't send six down the whole route, for example, because it wouldn't fit, but we, we can send four. So let's just do that. But it's irritating to have to try and figure all this out by ourselves. So once again, we are going to just try and get it uh, to go. We're going to try and get an algorithm that will just do this for us. Right, and the algorithm is called the fold fulkerson algorithm. And if we plug it in, we get this resulting graph that just tells us what, <laughs> what the best way to get all this water to the exit is. It turns out we can get eight uh, from the start to the end if we do it in this combination. And the ford fulkerson algorithm is it's not exceptionally complicated. It was came, come up with by two uh, computer scientists back in the 70s, um, but it's not something we need to know. It, it's an algorithm, so we can just say, hey, computer, do this algorithm, and then we'll grab the result and, you know, we'll say, hey, you know, we know how, how to get the most water through this. Thank you, computer. Uh, I'll now leave you to doing whatever you were doing before. So for our purposes, this Ford Fulkerson algorithm is just going to be a black magic box, a uh, magic black box even that we plug a maximum flow problem into and it gives us the answer. That's all you need to know about it. This problem is solved. Then we're going to move on to the final graph theory problem we're going to go through, which is bipartite maximum matching. Don't worry, it's not as scary as the name suggests. Um, a bipartite graph is one in which all nodes are divided into two different sets. So here it's V1 and V2. And the important thing is that no set is allowed to have an edge within that set. So you can't send, uh, have an edge between A and B, for example, they're in the same set. Every edge in this graph has to cross the gap between the two. Now, bipartite maximum matching just asks, for every node in V1, can I match it to a node in V2 along an edge? So you can't match A to E, for example, because there's no edge there, but you could choose to match A to F. And for this example, as per usual, it's not actually all that difficult. You could probably figure it out yourself. For bigger examples, we will want a computer. So here's uh, the answer to this one. Um, in fact, it's the only answer to this one. Uh, A matches to F, B matches to H, C matches to E, and D matches to G. No, we haven't used the D to F connection because if we match D to F, A has nothing it can match to. So, we are going to scale it up to, uh, to 
Oh, sorry. If we want to scale it up, we need an algorithm that a computer can follow. So humor me for a second while I do some things to this graph that will seem quite random to start with, but should make sense at the end. So I'm going to add a source node at the start. I'm going to add a sync node at the end. I'm going to connect all of the edges from the source node to all of the nodes in V1 and connect all of the edges from V2 to the sync node at the end. And then I'm just going to say, OK, all of this is now directional. Everything goes from the source to the sync. So these little squiggles that I've drawn are supposed to be arrows. Again, I apologize for how uh, <laughs> rubbish some of the diagrams in here are. Every pipe has capacity one, and I, I am now calling these pipes because this is essentially a maximum flow problem. I have converted it into that by adding the source and adding the sink. But importantly, I have not adjusted anything in the graph in the middle. That's still exactly the same. And the problem that we want to solve is still exactly the same. It's still how do we match up one of the nodes on the left to one of the nodes on the right for all of those nodes. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this graph that we've made and we're going to plug it into the Ford Fulkerson algorithm. And the Ford Fulkerson algorithm is just going to say, well, I have no idea why you're giving me a bypass like my graph here, but here you go. This is how you get the most water through. Uh, <laughs> and because all the edges are one, uh, either it has water flowing through it, one unit of water, or it doesn't, zero units of water. So we can actually replace this with just a nicer graph that looks like this. Uh, the red lines being the edges with water running through them, and the black lines being the edges without water running through them. And if you notice, the middle of this looks strikingly similar to that solution we found earlier. In fact, it has just matched every node on the left to every node on the right, well, to a node on the right. And if you think about this, you can probably figure out why. Uh, I need to find where in my notes I've gotten to, but uh, all right. We can send one gallon of per se, well, we can send one unit of water uh, from to every node on the left, even from the source. So each of these is receiving exactly one unit of water. Uh, it then has to cross the gap in the middle in order to be valid, because, of course, every node has to put out the same amount of water that it puts in. And then each node on the right can only send one uh, unit further to the right, so to the sink. So each can only be connected to one on the left, because each one on the left is trying to feed it one. Uh, if two things try and feed the same node one, then it will have two, and it, it has nowhere to put that extra water. So what Ford Fulkerson tells us here is, you know, wherever water is flowing, those are the matchings. You, you've just solved your bypass like maximum matching algorithm by converting it into a different one, into a maximum flow. And this is a very, very common way of solving problems in mathematics. There are smart people who have done smarter things than I can do in the past. So I will just make my problem into a problem that they've solved already. And then we can just say, OK, we'll, we'll plug your solution into it, and whatever we get out, that's the solution to my problem as well. And this is essentially what I'm going to be doing with the stalemate problem. I'm just going to be converting it into a different problem that's already solved. So let's talk about graph theory and diplomacy. Diplomacy is usually run on automated adjudicators, uh, and adjudicators are usually programmed. Of course, this is the old web dip interface because this map with this uh, presentation was made when the old web dip interface was more a thing, but yeah. Um, computers rarely see the same thing that we do. And when we see a map like this, what the computer is actually seeing is the graph behind it. And this, as you'll notice, is just the graph theory graph that I was talking about earlier. It has some different colors, but it still has nodes connected uh, to one another through edges. Those edges have some properties, which are what the colors are, but you don't need to know about them right now. Oh, actually, you do. Never mind. <laughs> the one in the bottom right, for example, is Syria. Um, that is connected with by to one node by a blue edge. That means only fleets can go this way, and that is Eastern Mediterranean. It's connected to one node by a green edge, uh, which is Armenia, and that means only armies can go this way. And I'm sure you can work out what the yellow one means. Uh, it, that is connected to Smyrna, and it means both the armies and fleets can go in that direction. 
So uh, there is one other type of edge that you might have noticed, and that's the black edge. Uh, there's one at the top of the map over by St. Petersburg that is not present in all adjudicators, but this is because my program grabs stuff from web diplomacy, and this is how web dip represents it. Um, this means that the second node is a sub-province of the first. So the node connected by a black edge is St. Petersburg North Coast. The actual node itself is St. Petersburg, and then the other one connected by a black edge is St. Petersburg South Coast. So that is the explanation of, of this graph. It's actually really helpful for the stalemate problem to look at the board this way. But for now, we're going to go back to our standard view because it's a lot nicer to look at. Um, and we're going to talk a bit more about how stalemates work. So our definition to start off was a stalemate line is a position which cannot be broken. And that's true, but when you're trying to solve a mathematical problem, you want something specific, you want a target you can reach, basically. And a proper definition for that is a set of defending units and orders is a stalemate line if and only if there does not exist any possible enemy attack which dislodges a defending unit. And the dislodging thing is actually really nice. You can say, okay, as soon as something is dislodged, we can just discount this. This stalemate line is not a stalemate line, right? Let's move ahead to problem number one that was looked at in the dissertation. Where can the enemy get to? And this is quite an, like, it's not a particularly difficult problem, but it's quite a neat one. Um, let's take the extreme scenario here where Turkey has managed to conquer 17 supply centers without having any units. It's probably a little unlikely to happen, but who knows? Maybe they were particularly uh, good at negotiating and managed to talk people into disbanding all their units after taking it. I had no idea. Um, the reason we're looking at it is... I, I, think that's, I think that's Andrew Goff's dream scenario right there. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> But yes, what it means is that any Turkish units that are a thing from now on have to come from the Turkish home supply centers, which is kind of neat for us because it means that we can say, okay, everything's starting here and then we'll look at where it can get to. So uh, an important rule, we said stalemate lines, none of the defending units are allowed to be dislodged. So if we just assume that's true for the moment, we'll figure out whether it actually is true later. Uh, we can say that Turkish units cannot go through any territory that has an enemy unit in it. Now, it's pretty easy for us to see where they can get to, but once again, we need to be able to tell a computer this, uh, how to do this, and the computer is just seeing the map as the graph on the right. Um, I've marked the provinces the defending units are in, in light blue. So take a second to think, is there anything that we've seen so far? This question is rhetorical, by the way, you don't need to speak out, um, that could help us do this. And the answer is yes, we have looked at uh, a few problems in graph theory, and one of them was graph traversal, the breadth first search that we saw earlier. Where can I get to from a specific point on a graph, um, just given an infinite amount of time? So here was the algorithm for that. Mark your starting node as visited and explore all edges connected to it. Repeat with any non-visited nodes you find and do this until you have nowhere left to go. So on diplomacy map, uh, our starting positions are Constantinople, Smyrna, and Ankara, anywhere where Turkey can build units. And we're just gonna breadth first search out from there. As you can see, it starts off pretty you know, as you would expect, I think there's actually a line here missing to Armenia from Smyrna, but whatever, they got there anyway. Uh, and then it slowly advances across the map. And it's actually really neat, um, this, because if you notice, this is also just the places where a unit could be on any particular turn. So this is one turn after it's built. This is two turns after it's built. Three turns after it's built. Now we're approaching the stalemate line. Four turns after it's built. Five turns after it's built, six turns, uh, hang on. Something has gone wrong here. Something has gone very, very wrong. So our normal graph traversal is really not working. I wonder why that is. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious to spot where the problem is for anyone who's played much diplomacy. Um, let me just see if I have this place in my notes. Yeah, 
So the problem is there, this step right here, where it moves from Livonia into the Gulf of Bothnia. Under our rules that we set, uh, it is not allowed to move through a province that has an enemy unit in it, and yeah, and it can only move along edges that are connected. And this is actually perfectly fine by both of those rules. It is connected to the Gulf of Bothnia, um, Livonia is, and it's not moving through any enemy unit. There's no enemy unit blocking it. So should Germany have to block that province? Well, no, clearly not, because in a stalemate line here, Turkey would only ever have an army in this position. They would never have a fleet, unless they'd already broken through the stalemate line, in which case this is not really, uh, like, <laughs> that's not a uh, something we're considering. So we need to adapt our algorithm to consider the type of the units. We can't allow an army to mysteriously turn into a fleet and then start invading the North Sea. So let's do it in two parts here. Something really important is that it's only really fleets that have that restriction because convoys exist. If a Turkish fleet can get to a province, then a Turkish army can too because you can just convoy it over into that province, um, maybe over a couple of turns, but like if you just assume you have as many fleets as you need, you can convoy it anywhere a fleet can get to as long as it's not actually in the ocean. So really all we have to do is figure out where the fleets can get first and then do the army search from there and then we're all right. So first we're going to breadth first search through fleet and coastal connections only, places where fleets could get. And as you can see to start with, it's pretty much the same. The only difference is that Bulgaria is now split into its coasts because that's where the fleets would go. Um, now. Turkey's fleets have reached the limits of where they're going to go in the uh, Black Sea, but they're just going to keep expanding over here in the Mediterranean. And one last thing, this time I have added in a couple of edges called attack vectors. And these are the ones right at the end where it tries to move into the uh, enemy territory and it figures out, oh, hang on, there's an enemy there. I, I'm not allowed to do that. And the reason I'm adding these edges in this time is it's actually pretty important to keep account uh, of where those edges are for the actual thing. It's much more important to know where units can attack through, like which units can attack what, than it is to actually know where the units are. So uh, the last one is just, yeah, the last step is just adding this Piedmont um, to Marseille attack vector. And then we're going to relabel all of the land provinces we, we've reached as army starting points. So we're saying, I've convoyed an army everywhere I can possibly convoy an army to. Notice that Bulgaria now is in the land province, not the coast anymore, because it's an army it's being convoyed in. And now we're just going to do a land breadth first search through those provinces. Um, so through the land connections and the coast connections, but these armies cannot go through sea connections, which is hopefully going to save us up there in Livonia because as you can see there, it cannot anymore expand into the Gulf of Bothnia. So this is essentially it for how you figure out where units can get to. Um, yeah, that is the entire problem. We'll see if I've got anything else written in my notes, but I think that's as far as it goes. So problem number two, stalemate detection. Now this is significantly easier than stalemate construction, uh, but it's still a bit of an interesting problem. Given a set of defending orders and units, can the line be broken? This is if you're already given a stalemate line. So if someone is, for, well, for example, entering what France and Germany are entering here, is there any way Turkey can break this? If there exists any enemy order set which dislodges a unit, remember we can prove that this isn't a stalemate line because that's our definition of stalemate lines. There has to be no existence no existing order set that dislodges any defending units. Now, first off, you may have noticed that from the previous slide, uh, hang on. here there were a lot of enemy unit possible locations. Here we've narrowed it down to just these ones, and that's obviously because these are the only ones that can attack the enemy units. Uh, there is no point in sticking a unit in Syria on the board because it's not going to do anything, right? We're just going to stick units in all the provinces where they can possibly attack the, uh, the defenders, and we're only going to consider those ones. So 
We can't test this just by plugging one Turkish moveset into an adjudicator and seeing like the best Turkish moveset, because there's no one best Turkish moveset. An example is that Munich can be attacked by three Turkish units here, Berlin can be attacked by two, but in order to do both at once, you would need Cilicia to be doing two different things at the same time, which we can't do. However, Turkey does have infinite amounts of turns to break this line because stalemate lines are supposed to hold forever. So what Turkey can do is enter a bunch of different best orders, one by one, and just keep testing that against every province. And in fact, that's what we're going to have them do. We're going to have them attack every single province with the best attack that they can do, uh, and we will see whether every single province holds against that. So, for example, let's have a look at Mid-Atlantic Ocean, and I apologize again for how terrible this diagram is. It goes to show how much of a hurry I was in when I was making this in the first place. I really should have improved it a little bit. Um, to break Mid-Atlantic Ocean, this is the Turkish attempt. They have units in Western Mediterranean, and they have a unit in North Africa. We can assume that North Africa's fleet, because that would be what the useful unit there is. Um, and yeah, if it was an army, then Turkey would have an infinite amount of time to get that army out of there and stick a fleet in instead. And so it's going to be 2v2 here, because North Africa supports Western Mediterranean and Mid-Atlantic Ocean, and Portugal supports Mid-Atlantic Ocean. There is nothing Turkey can do to make a better attack on Mid-Atlantic Ocean than that, so the defenders hold that province. Now we can look at Spain, and it's very much the same story. They attack with two, Western Mediterranean and Gulf of Lyon, and they are against two, Gascony and Spain, the defenders hold. And in fact, we can do this all the way along the line until we reach St. Petersburg. So the line holds in this case. Every province holds against the simulated strongest attack, therefore no defender can be dislodged. And you can see I've written the little red numbers on this. This is the maximum possible attack strength the attacker can bring against the province. And there's a fairly obvious conclusion you can draw from this, which is the attack strength against any particular frontline province is just the number of attack vectors going into it. Um, if you look at Munich, for example, it's three here. I apologize for how the three does not stand out very well, but yeah. There are Tyrolia, Bohemia, and Silesia have attack vectors on Munich. And the best attack that they can make is when all of them attack Munich at once. You cannot get anything more than that, because to get more than that, you would require something which cannot reach Munich to attack it. The number of attack vectors is the maximum possible. So really, we don't actually need to do all of the simulations that I was talking about before, where you just look at each province and say, okay, can it hold against this blah, 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 blah. All you need to do is count the number of attack vectors going in and say, is that equal to the number of defense, to, to the defensive strength or less than the defensive strength? And if that's the case everywhere, then the defense holds. But there is an issue with that. There's a thing called frontline supports, which we didn't see any of in this. Uh, thankfully for us, all the frontline provinces were being very nice and holding. That would be St. Petersburg, Munich, uh, Berlin, Marseille, Spain, and, and uh, Mid-Atlantic Ocean. The defenders aren't attempting to use them to support because they'll probably get cut, and then the support isn't really worth it anyway. Frontline supports have a tendency to mess things up. Um, okay, I was supposed to have another slide in here, but I guess not. Let's keep moving anyway. So here we're looking at a slightly different um, stalemate scenario where Germany has advanced a little in the east and France has lost a little in the west. And you'll see the France situation in a few seconds. But here we will see why frontline supports are not usually really anything. Because if you are, if you want a frontline support to repel this attack, uh, then Galicia can just cut Warsaw, and then there's there's no frontline support that, that works here. So the defending strength is just reduced back to two again. So the question is, how do we account for that in the scenario where we're not simulating all of these attacks, where we're just saying, okay, there are two. Uh, so let's go back to it a second here. We're saying there are two attack vectors into this province, therefore it's two versus two, and therefore we're, you know, we're even. 
The problem is if the defender is using a province that can be cut for that, then that defensive strength is misleading. It's not actually what you'd get because the defender would get cut on the front line. So one possibility is just discount all frontline supports. Like if Warsaw is uh, supporting Moscow here, we'll just say that support doesn't exist. And that is a possibility, but we run into another problem if we do it. And it does make sense off the bat because you think, okay, it's on the front line, therefore there is an enemy unit that can reach it, therefore the enemy unit will cut it, therefore it would never work. But here is the scenario where that is different. We have Turkey has advanced into Spain on this, and France is using Portugal to support hold Mid-Atlantic Ocean. And Technically, in the simulated scenario, we have the best attack against Middle Atlantic Ocean being North Africa and Spain support uh, Western Mediterranean to Middle Atlantic Ocean, which is three. The defender has three uh, strengths, so it holds. But if we discount all frontline supports, then Portugal is considered to be cut here because there's a possibility that Spain walks in and cuts it. And so... If we're doing that, then our algorithm says, oh, it's a three versus two for the attacker, therefore the attacker will win, when clearly they won't. So why is this a problem here? The reason is that uh, the rule assumes that Spain will cut Portugal, and it absolutely could do that, but if it does that, then it cannot support the move into the Atlantic Ocean. It's asking it to do two different things at the same time. And we are assuming in our simulation that every time the attacker is using the, the maximum possible attack, and therefore anything like this would not be able to happen. So we need to have a rule that allows frontline supports in this scenario if the only units which could cut them are already participating in the attack. And it's a bit wordy, but here's the frontline support rule. <laughs> Frontline supports usually don't count. We usually just discount them completely unless every unit with an attack vector against them also has an attack vector against the province they're supporting. So in this case, it's uh, Spain has an attack vector against Portugal. It could cut Portugal, but it also has an attack vector against the Atlantic Ocean, which is the province that Portugal is supporting. So Portugal's support is valid. It can only be cut by something that will be attacking the province it's supporting. And these are the final rules for stalemate line detection. Again, it's a little wordy, I apologize for that. Um, but if the defending strength is at least equal to the attacking strength in all frontline territories, the line is a stalemate under these rules. So the attack strength is always just the number of attack vectors into it. That's not a problem to count. That's just, we, we got that from our depth first search or breadth first search even. <laughs> Always get those two mixed up. Um, the defense strength of a province is the number of support holds it has plus one, because the plus one is because it provides one strength itself, minus all frontline supports, except the special case that we talked about before, uh, where the or every um, attack vertex on that also goes to the province it's supporting. And in this case, Portugal and Gascony are both special cases because Spain is the only thing that can attack them but Spain would have to be attacking the uh, province they're supporting. So that is the stalemate detection. Now we go to the last section of this, which is stalemate construction. And I apologize, this part of the presentation was slightly rushed in the first place, and I haven't gone back and, and fixed it. So hopefully it will still be reasonable. It's also the most complicated bit, so we'll see. <laughs> All right, so this is the ultimate goal of any diplomacy uh, stalemate problem. Actually, no, it's not. Uh, what I've got here is an algorithm which constructs a stalemate line given a front line. And that's not always helpful because if you know your front line, you probably already know where the stalemate line is. Uh, so a better goal would be to construct a nearby stalemate given, given your unit positions, but it turns out that was too hard to do in the time that I was given. So, uh, hey, if anyone else there wants to give it a go <laughs> who is better at this than me, go ahead. Um, but in the meantime, we are going back to look at this scenario, the major stalemate line held from the north. And this time I've removed all of the friendly units from the board because what we're going to do is we're going to construct a stalemate line. We're going to tell the, uh, well, the, the player 
where they need to put their units and what they need to support in order to set up a stalemate line at this position. So all we know is where these white dots are, where our frontline provinces are. And we have already generated where the Turkish player can reach. You can do that with just the front line because the front line provinces are the only ones that the Turkish player cannot get through, right? So we also know the attack vectors on every province. Okay, so we already know the maximum attack strength against each frontline province. We figured that out earlier. It's just the number of incoming attack vectors. Uh, so against Munich here, for example, it's three, against Berlin it's two, and so on and so forth. In this case, we won't actually use that because we're going to use graph theory instead. <laughs> Remember back to that maximum bipartite matching problem from earlier. It wasn't just a tangent, it is actually going to be used. And just in case you need a reminder, here it is. Um, the maximum matching problem asks you to match one node from each of V1 to one node in each of V2. This is surprisingly relevant to stalemate lines because of the way diplomacy's combat works. Every support is worth one strength. So if you have one support hold against one support move, you will have a tied situation where the attacker cannot advance. So if you can match every one of your support holds to an enemy support move, then you've solved the stalemate problem. Uh, for example, if Turkey is attacking Mid-Atlantic Ocean with Western Med supported by North Africa, and you're supporting Mid-Atlantic Ocean to hold with Portugal, you are matching Portugal to uh, North Africa, the two supports, um, and you hold the province. And we discount the move and the hold because they always cancel each other out. So Mid-Atlantic Ocean cancels out Western Mediterranean in that situation. So we're going back to this map again. What is one enemy support here on this map? Well, we know that the maximum possible attack against each frontline province is the one where everything with an attack vector participates in the attack. So for example, the attack on Middle Atlantic Ocean is Western Mediterranean and North Africa. They attack together, uh, and it doesn't really matter which one is moving and which one isn't. Now, as we said before, the moving unit cancels with the unit that's holding in the first place because they both have one strength. So we are going to remove one attack vector from every single one of these provinces uh, because that's just the one that's countered by the unit being there in the first place. So there we go. Now we've got a much cleaner map <laughs> and uh, much less attack. These are the number of support moves that we need to match with support holds for each province. Now, you might think this is pretty easy to do. And honestly, for this example, it's really not that difficult. The problems come usually when you have much bigger variants um, that have a lot of things that you need to consider. But there is one problem that can happen here, and we're going to take an example of it. You cannot just randomly stuff units behind your provinces and then set them to support hold the, uh, the provinces that need support holding, because you could end up in a situation like this. So here we've randomly decided to put down Army Kiel and Army Burgundy, and we are using Army Kiel to, to support hold Army Berlin, and we're using Army Burgundy to support hold Marseille. And now we're just thinking, okay, how can I protect Munich? I need to get two units on that. Oh, wait, I think we've run into a problem here. <laughs> You cannot uh, fit an extra unit in there. We only have one uh, that we can put in row. And the reason for this is we put our other units in the wrong place. We, it's a pretty easy fix. We can just move Kiel to Baltic or uh, Burgundy to Gascony and then stick an extra unit in one of those, which will defend Munich. But ideally, we wouldn't end up in the situation in the first place where we have to reassign. Because especially in larger variants, ripples like that can cause big problems in your line further on down. So the actual solution that I came up with for my dissertation was build a graph inside the map. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to add a node for each support move we need to counter. So remember, the number of support moves is the number of attack vectors left because we removed the one that represents the move. Uh, so we are adding in one black node here for each support move that we need to counter. So then we're going to add a node for each province that we could put a supporting unit in. And these ones are highlighted in green. Obviously, there's a lot of them. 
we can't put units in all of them. We can't do the same thing that we did for Turkey and just assume that you have the maximum possible number of units because the defenders have to fix something in place. They're not allowed to just go around and, you know, adjust themselves and take an infinite number of turns to figure out what they're doing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to connect every supporting province to every support move it could counter. So we're going to say, okay, North Atlantic Ocean can counter this attack on Mid Atlantic Ocean down here. So we're going to connect North Atlantic Ocean support hold to this attack support move. And that doesn't mean that we've decided to put a unit in North Atlantic Ocean yet. What it means is if we put a unit in North Atlantic Ocean, we could use it to counter that support hold. And yeah, our graph is getting a little bit complicated now, but don't worry, it will get even more so. This graph is bipartite. Green nodes only connect to black nodes and vice versa. Now, if you remember our bipartite definition, you have to have two separate groups of nodes and they're not allowed to connect inside their groups. So green can't connect to green, black can't connect to black. That's all already done here. We know it's bipartite. If we match one green node to each black node, we know that we will have enough support holds to hold every province, one matching each support move that the enemy can order. And we know how to solve the bipartite maximum matching problem. We just convert it into another one. <laughs> We're turning this into maximum flow, and this graph is looking like a bunch of spiders at this point. But it makes more sense to a computer than it does to us, I promise. So uh, something I haven't highlighted on this, just because you, you saw my drawings earlier, I think it would make it even more confusing. All edges are directed from the source to the sink, and all edges have capacity one. And we are going to go ahead and say, hey, board Fulkerson algorithm, this is a bunch of pipes. It's not a diplomacy map anymore. We're going to try and force water through it. Can you tell us how to get the most water we can through this diplomacy map? And that's what Ford Fulkerson does. It just takes the graph and it says, hey, you know, this is my job. I will just go ahead and tell you how much water you can get through and how exactly to do that. And this is what we end up with. We end up with a graph where one water is flowing along each of these red lines. And this solves the bipartite maximum matching problem in this way. If we just remove all of the, the, the sink and the source nodes and we just leave the green and black, combined with the places where the water is flying across, we get uh, the green node here is matched up to St. Petersburg. So the green node in Barents is matched up to the unit attacking St. Petersburg. So we say, OK, we're matching our support hold to the support move that's attacking St. Petersburg. So we'll stick a unit in Barents and we'll support hold St. Petersburg with it. Same with this unit down here in the Baltic. Um, it is matched up to the attack, the support move against Berlin. So we're saying, OK, it needs to be support holding Berlin to counter that. And so on and so forth, all the way along the line here, uh, we set up the graph as is on the in the final uh, slide here <laughs> on the right. And that is pretty much all my dissertation was. It looks pretty sim like it. OK, it doesn't look entirely simple when you look at the, uh, the Ford Fulkerson bit of it, but it works for any diplomacy map. It does need to have a few caveats in it, um, specifically with regard to that frontline support which I didn't discuss in terms of the final algorithm here, but it gets a bit complicated, so I'm going to leave that. Um, and this also doesn't take into account dynamics, dynamic stalemate lines, which is when you attack uh, as the defender and you specifically go and cut a bunch of enemy supports. But that's really difficult to do because you then also have to reinforce your line to make sure that the provinces that are doing the cutting aren't taken. Um, so I didn't cover those ones in that. I'm sure it's possible with that as well. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this was uh, my entire dissertation on stalemate lines. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed the uh, interesting branch of math that actually corresponds to diplomacy. I don't have a final slide, I'm afraid. But if anyone has a question, feel free to ask. So are you still waiting for your your grade or, or your, your PhD? <laughs> I am indeed still waiting for my grade on this, yes. Um, as I mentioned, the actual 
uh, dissertation itself had quite a lot of fluff. It was uh, there's a good part of, part of it that's just converting the diplomacy rules into um, like mathematical formula, which is honestly completely pointless. But it it, it made the the presentation a bit longer, so it was uh, probably worth it for the grades. Um, but yeah, that's why I just showed the presentation here and not the actual dissertation. Is there any way you could use this idea in a game? Um, if you're like one or two moves away from creating a stalemate line to calculate how quickly you needed to move to that stalemate line so you don't go there too early and lock the game up for no reason? That is an excellent question, and that actually is what uh, the ultimate goal of this was to start with, um, this dissertation. So the, the goal I stated in my initial brief was that I'd like to be able to put in a, a position on a diplomacy board and it would tell you where is the closest stalemate line how do I get to it and it turns out that's a lot more difficult than just figuring out where the front line is um, because in the front line you can just do this by parsite stuff when you have to uh, in order so the front line calculates this for one stalemate line right and it turns out there's a lot of possible stalemate lines on a diplomacy board um, so if you're trying to figure out where is the closest one, you either need to have a database of all of the stalemate lines on the diplomacy board, which is fine for classic, people have figured that out, it's not fine for variants, uh, or you need to figure out some kind of clever algorithm that will limit, you know, the possibilities of stalemate lines drastically, uh, and maybe just crawl across the board looking for one which I could not figure out in, in time within the year, unfortunately. But I'd love to uh, <laughs> to see it done if someone can manage it. You also have to worry about the uh, problem of... Uh, you cut out for a second for me there. I don't know if that was the same for everyone else. Could you type it in uh, Masterclass chat? Yes, you, you absolutely have to worry about the problem of supply. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that makes total sense. So the, the, the reason that I don't focus on the problem of supply in this presentation is that it's actually really simple to calculate. And the step that you calculate it on is, hang on, uh, this one, the breadth first search. Because the breadth first search tells you everywhere where the enemy can get to, which means that you know everywhere that you have under your control uh, that the enemy cannot possibly take from you. So you know what the maximum supply is off the bat. And when you actually do the um, the final algorithm, hang on, I have to go forward a bit here, but right at this step, you know, okay, I need, in fact, actually before this step, because this is matching up support holds to support moves, right? Um, at, do I have it somewhere here? Yeah, there. This step right here, you're told how many units you need for every, uh, to defend every province here. So I need two to defend Middle Atlantic Ocean, I need two to defend Spain, two to defend Marseille, three to defend Munich, two to defend Berlin, and two to defend St. Petersburg. And what you just do is you add all of those together, and then you compare that to the number of supply centers behind the line, and then that's all good. The one uh, instance where it becomes problematic is when, for example, Germany has more SCs than France does, uh, and it requires a German unit in a supply center that France controls, because then Germany takes the supply center off France, France has to blow up a unit, and the stalemate line fails again. <laughs> but uh, when you're just doing this, this particular uh, problem, where you already know the front line and everything, you can just set it up. So it's the, so that that's not a problem. When you're doing it on a real diplomacy board, yes, it will be more of an issue that you have to figure out. It's, any other questions? Uh, so Theoretically, if you did a master's on this, um, would you be able to figure out, based on where the enemy units were at any point, um, what builds you'd need to do through the algorithm? Yes, you should be able to. It's uh, not too difficult to figure out where any unit has to come from in order to get to its position on the line, uh, because you'll know, okay, I've got X amount of turns until Turkey is in this position. Um, I need to be in this position by then, for example. Uh, so I've got X amount of turns to get a unit there. 
And you can just use the breadth first search we saw earlier because the breadth first search tells you how many turns it takes to get to any individual province. That's the number of iterations that you've done of the breadth first search. For example, hang on. Let's, uh, this is the naive one, but yeah, we'll go with this. This is one turn, this is two turns, this is three turns, etc. So you just count how many iterations it takes you to get there, and then you say, okay, I, I have three turns to get to one of these locations. I can get there from any of these uh, places. So in this case, it would be uh, in reverse. This would be if you wanted to get a unit to Ankara, Smyrna, or Constantinople. You could get there from any of these ones because it's been three turns of the uh, breadth fit search. So that shouldn't be too difficult to do, no. The problem is figuring out that you need the units in the first place. Yeah, uh, I will release the slides after the presentation. In fact, I might just, I think they're Google slides, so I can just share them on the uh, share a link. Um, all the speaker notes are what I was supposed to say during this. I think I went off a bit at some points, but uh, it, it's vaguely right. Um, and yes, the, the long media match video is just publicly available. I'll stick it in the chat afterwards. Uh, the dissertation is not currently publicly available. I'm going to wait until I get uh, my results to publish that, but I will publish it afterwards if anyone actually wants to read through it. As I've said before, warning, it is a lot of fluff and stuff that you really don't need to know. But then I guess so is this presentation, so. Uh, theoretically, with that, one could highlight the forming stalemate lines or present ones on the board. Yes, absolutely. That's already quite easily possible for Classic because it's been around so long, people have just gone in depth on the map and gone, okay, where are all the stalemate lines here? And they've calculated them all already. So if someone really wanted to, they could just take that library and stick it into software and say, hey, you know, these are the nearby stalemate lines to your units. You could be pretty naive about that. It would be more difficult to say these are the ones you could actually get into position for, but it, it would certainly be possible. But yeah, yeah, for variant maps, that's very, very different because people haven't looked into all of these possibilities. Could a, um, a practical application of this be to um, make a, a website available for newer players so that they can plug their position in Let's say if they're in press diplomacy and they had time where an AI could tell them their quickest path to a stalemate line? Yes, probably. But again, it, on the classic map, it's probably better uh, rather than using this whole, con this whole algorithm to figure out where, well, there's a lot of yeah, stuff in there. But um, rather than using this algorithm, because this requires you already know the front line, uh, it would probably be easier just to use that library that people have already made and grab the position from it. This is, uh, yeah, th this is specifically useful for variants and such. Where can you find one of these already calculated lines? There is a huge uh, collection of them over on the diplomatic pouch, I think. Um, I can provide a link to that. I'm just thinking because sometimes when you're talking with people and you need to set up a line, you'll send them like there's a um there's a good link on Brotherboard's website with a lot of the stalemate lines, and you'll send it to them. And if they're too new, you kind of need to tell them how to get there as well. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. That can yeah. cause problems. It can. I'd also be a little worried about automating everything away, uh, just because then it's just like you have the, <laughs> the problem of it gets too easy to set up this kind of thing. And like stalemate yeah. lines are a bit of a problem in that if they, you know, they kind of, they can ruin the end game if they're too easy to make. Um, if people are too, too quick to jump to a stalemate line and stop attacking, as I mentioned before, diplomacy tends to be biased towards the defenders anyway. So if you have very large powers who just immediately start to form a stalemate line, uh, you are <laughs> not going to have a very entertaining game. Um, so yeah, I'd shy away from making it too easy, but it's certainly a possibility to automate this kind of thing. This is the link to the stalemates. Um, resources on the diplomatic pouch. I think the, the best ones are probably the series of progression, progressive X, um, or the visual index to stalemate positions is also a very good one. They don't show where exactly your units need to be, but they do, sh they do rise it out. So 
that's quite useful. Marcus, was your diplomacy, was your, your supervisor a diplomacy player? Uh, no, he was not. He is a, a, he's a computer science professor at the University of Glasgow. Um, the one I initially approached was a diplomacy player uh, oh, quite a long time ago, but he was leaving the year that I uh, wanted to do it, so he unfortunately wasn't able to supervise. Uh, but Gethin is incredible. Um, <laughs> Gethin Norman. I highly recommend University of Glasgow Computer Science specifically because he's there. He's fantastic. That is the fault of the gaming philosophy of players as much as it is the problem of the particular map itself. Yes, if players are very quick to give up on their own solo chances, then yes, uh, it's usually to do with the, the player's attitude and you need to try and teach them to take more risks. But it doesn't change the fact that if this thing is more easily available, then people would probably be quicker to form stalemate lines, which might make things worse. That's kind of just the problem with AI in general, right? We had the um, the uh, gumbo tournament on WebDip a while ago with Meta's AI, and it was really good at gumbo, uh, surprisingly so. And I'm a little worried about how good it was because I have a feeling that we could get to the point that uh, it is just best in gumbo diplomacy to follow an AI's move. Um, but we'll see whether they can get there or not. It was fairly close between the uh, the humans and the bot at the end of the day. Uh, the top humans and the bot, anyway. Anyway, that was just a random aside. <laughs> All right, so any last questions? Uh, I need to potentially... Well, I know Karthik needs to go and prepare for BlitzCon soon, <laughs> but uh, I will head off to do that too shortly, so... If anyone has a question they would really like to ask, now would be a great time to do it. I thought that, he did, that the humans beat the Facebook bots in Gunboat. No, so um, Facebook used four bots. Uh, the first two were Facebook bots, and the last two were uh, other baseline um, bots from other people from before. And the, the two at the end were significantly worse. Uh, the Humans beat them easily. The first one, I think, tied with the top human player more or less, maybe a little bit lower. The second one was reasonably above the top human player. Um, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this kind of seems strange to me. How it's it's not like chess when you have one opponent, you have like <laughs> so between zero to six opponents. So I don't know. Yeah, that's certainly interesting. It, it should be said, it, it beat the best results of the best player in that tournament. It wasn't necessarily the best player in... Uh, uh, okay, that's in a different players. thing then. <laughs> Correct. All, all Californians were excluded from the tournament, and that's where all the best <laughs> players are. So <laughs> I see. If, if there is no good players there, then that's another question. No, no, no. There were some good players. Marcus was one of those players, but, but there were no... I'm not sure you know how good Marcus is. <laughs> 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 and it's also I think it's very different to play Gumboat against like a bunch of varied skill opponents than it is against purely uh, high level Gumboat players so it was trained against uh, well it was this tournament was people of very varied skill levels so we'll uh, see <laughs> we'll see how it does against um, purely high skill players at some point I'd imagine yeah, I'm going to go ahead and call it there then. It's been great. Thank you for listening. Um, well, I, sh I probably shouldn't say it's been great. It's been, been great to have you all as an audience. <laughs> Thank you for showing up. Uh, I really appreciate it. I see you, Marcus. Thanks so much, Marcus. It's a great presentation. You've been listening to Masterclass. To participate in future Masterclass sessions, please join the Virtual World Diplomacy Community's Discord server by following the link in the episode description. And remember to subscribe to the Diplomacy Dojo podcast for Brotherboard's Dojo, as well as future Masterclass recordings. Thanks to Frederick Larden for the music Robot is Chilling, used here in our intro and outro. <laughs>